If it's American and it was flown by the Air Force, chances are it's here. So we are in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, and this is, of course, the Air Force's national institution, and it is the world's oldest and largest military aviation museum. Uh, the museum dates its creation back to 1923. There is no other collection of military aircraft like this collection here. So the museum started originally as a study collection, an engineering study collection. During World War I, they collected engines from around the world and aircraft. And uh, this location, McCook Field and later Wright Field here in Dayton, was really a hub of innovation in aviation. And the museum was in various places around the base, was in a hiatus status during World War II because there was really no time for museum work. Uh, it was located on the other side of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in a building that really was not adequate for museums. And then finally, in the early 1970s, the museum moved to this permanent location. And one after the other after the other, these buildings have been built. It's difficult to describe just how big the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force is. There are more than 19 acres under roof alone and more than 300 aircraft on display. And it's organized uh, very rationally. There's an early years gallery, there's a World War II gallery, Korea, Vietnam, Cold War, a hall of missiles, the space gallery, the R&D gallery, the global reach gallery, and the presidential galleries. Most of the aircraft in the collection at the National Museum of the Air Force are the real thing. There are a few reproductions in the early years gallery of World War I aircraft, but once we get out of that gallery, these are all real, real aircraft, and many of them are real combat veterans. There are so many unique and important aerospace vehicles here at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. So there are numerous early aircraft, for instance, the world's only B-10 bomber, which was incredibly advanced. Late 1920s, early 1930s, it was faster than any fighter in production. And then in our World War II gallery, our newest addition, the B-17F Memphis Bell, that iconic American treasure, which went on display historically, 75 years to the day after the crew finished their 25th mission in 1943. We have two twin Mustangs, and uh, one is uh, an F-82E, and that was used on an incredible flight. It uh, set a record. It took off from New York, and it landed in Hawaii, unrefueled, which is really remarkable. And then our other F-82 is uh, painted and marked as an F-82 night fighter in Korea. It was an F-82 night fighter that scored the first aerial victory of the Korean War. In our new building, we have our presidential gallery, which is, it truly is a national collection. There are nine presidential aircraft and a presidential helicopter. And for those presidential aircraft, you can actually get on board. And those include FDR Sacred Cow, and also Sam 26000, which was President Kennedy's aircraft, which flew him to Dallas and flew his body back after he was assassinated. There are numerous aerospace vehicles from our allies and from our opponents. So for instance, in the World War I gallery is an extremely rare Halberstadt. Uh, it's an original biplane, uh, German uh, aircraft from World War I. There is an ME-163 rocket fighter, ME-262 jet fighter, BF-109 and FW-190 conventional fighters. And then with friendly aircraft, there are two Spitfires in our collection and a Mosquito that represent reverse Lend-Lease. And there are more than 40 cutting edge and sometimes completely failing R&D aircraft. And the, the real centerpiece and premier aerospace vehicle in that gallery is our XB-70. And there were two that were built. One was destroyed in a mid-air collision and it weighed a half million pounds on takeoff. And yet it could go three times the speed of sound. And it did this before the first episode of Star Trek ever aired.
for many of our first time visitors, there's, there's awe uh, and, and they are overwhelmed. I mean, this, this institution is just physically enormous. It is absolutely free to come into these galleries. There's no charge for parking. There's no charge for entrance. Our visitors can come here and just enjoy learning about the history and heritage of the U.S. Air Force. So we have, we have two main parts of our mission. We exist to tell the story of the service and sacrifice of airmen through the decades, and then to inspire our youth. And those are our main goals. And we want people to come here and really appreciate that there are people who have done absolutely amazing things and they may not have known it, but they've protected our country. And also to understand that, you know, especially for young people, when they come through here, they see what people have done and they maybe get the idea, you know, I might be able to do that too. You know, maybe I'll, maybe I want to design these airplanes or maybe I want to be in the Air Force and I want to be one of these pilots or I want to work on these amazing machines. And I've talked to numerous people up to and including four-star generals who've told me that when they were kids, they came to the museum and they were inspired to join the Air Force. It is essential to have institutions that preserve and tell these stories. Not everyone wants to pick up a book. Not everyone wants to turn on the TV and watch documentaries, but there are many people who will take a weekend, take a road trip and come out and walk through these galleries. We are obligated to preserve the memory of these individuals who have served our countries. And without these kinds of institutions, I have no doubt that these things would just be simply lost.